podcast is for mature audiences only. Listener discretion is advised. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. How's that for a slice of fried gold? Remember Mad Cow Disease? Well, Mad Cow became Mad Person, became Mad Zombie. Right, we have to get out of here. If we don't, they'll come up here and they'll tear us to pieces. And that is really going to exacerbate things for all of us. You're listening to Dead Sock, the all zombie podcast. I'm your host, uh, Jeff. With me is my best friend, Ernie. I'm Ernie. That's me, guys. How you doing? So uh, pretty much what we're going to do in this podcast um, is go over a lot of things like uh, zombie news in the media, uh, movie reviews and miscellaneous uh, entertainment reviews and discussions, things of like games, books, other media, uh, as well as survival topics, zombies in history slash real life zombie tales. I just did uh, air quotes in case you're wondering. Oh, nice. I didn't even see him, folks. I'm all the way over here in uh, New York State. That's, that, that's right. Ernie is in New York. I'm in uh, Rhode Island. So, yeah, that's right. You just moved. I did. I just moved to Rhode Island. Uh, it's great. Speaking of New York, actually, last night I went to uh, this hot dog place called New York Lunch. And supposedly, there, there were rumors that uh, you could only get these styles of hot dogs in Rhode Island and New York. But then on further research, we found that you can only get these hot dogs in Rhode Island, but every hot dog place in Rhode Island sells this style of hot dog. And they're pork and veal, so they're orange. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a fantastic story, Jeff. <laughs> well, you gotta know, get people to know us, you know, to like who we are as people, to know our lives. Yeah, I mean, we, we both enjoy hot dogs from time to time. I myself have never had an orange hot dog unless, you know, of course it's slathered and mustard. Well, but... you know what? When you come up to Rhode Island, you're going to have an orange hot dog. All right. Anyway, zombies. Right, right. Back to what we're saying. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then, you know, way down the line, once this gets a little bit bigger, I want to have interviews with uh, quote-unquote zombie figureheads, uh, maybe like Max Brooks, people like him. Huh, sounds and, good. And eventually, if, once a month, I want to do a monthly roundtable uh, in which it's a bunch of people all together online, all discussing one topic. But I want to do it live, and I want to have it so people can comment in via, like, a chat box or a chat window and comment on it and then kind of steer the the discussion one way or another and see where we end up at the end but that's the future of a uh, dead talk right now we're going to jump head first into things um <clears throat> so first thing i really want to cover is uh kind of old news at this point uh i think you know where i'm going ernie yeah, I mean, this whole zombie bug has caught the entire nation with this rash of uh, <clears throat> cannibalistic crimes and everything. Right. Everybody's talking about it. My sister from, from Pennsylvania called me and she says, hey, me and my friends are talking about zombies. And my response was, well, you and everybody else, huh? <laughs> exactly. And of course, people, we were referring to the, uh, the Miami zombie and uh, subsequent outbreak, quote unquote, stories. Now, what do you, what do you think? Do you really think that... It, it's absolutely without a doubt there's no way this guy was there's nothing wrong with him he's just on a lot of drugs or are you of the people who think that there might be something else that we're not knowing like like but like what do you what do you think Ernie about this whole thing well I stand on both sides of that really now I don't necessarily think he's a true and true zombie as we see zombies um, and in my experimental past I have tried certain drugs not this bath salts that they're talking about <laughs> but I've had the marijuana equivalent to bath salts uh -huh. uh, which was called K2 and things like that oh and yeah, they, yeah yeah they really do they're, they're strange man they're not they're not natural. I mean, you, you feel like you're possessed at some points. I mean, the packaging actually really got into my head the one time that I was smoking it, and I felt like I was a demon. It's, <laughs> uh, I don't know, it's it's scary stuff, and I would suggest to everybody out there, don't try these things. If you're going to do any kind of drugs, you know, stick to natural stuff. But I mean, no. I, I definitely agree with you on that front. I mean, you know me, I don't, I've, I've tried my drugs, I've, you know, I've smoked weed a couple times, it's just... It's not my thing, but I agree. If you're going to do drugs, which is fine, you want to do them, do them, but just stick to natural stuff. There's really, I don't see a point in putting chemicals into your body that you don't need. You know, save the formaldehyde and things like that that I smoke in my cigarettes every day, but, you know. Yeah, true. Regardless of that. But um, I mean, with these things, especially with bath salts, they're a new drug. There hasn't been research on these things, and we don't know the potential side effects. And one of them could be zombification. It could be, or, or some form, i.e., or akin to 28 Days Later, like a rage virus or something like that. 
more so than you know zombies. But either way, it could do anything. We don't know at this point. Now, I'd also like to add that uh, the person who introduced me to this line of drugs was a, uh, a military, uh, an ex-military person. Mm -hmm. And the reason that he and his military friends were doing this was because they were legal. They hadn't been illegalized yet and everything like that. But my own conspiracy theory mind, I'm thinking, man, I heard this intel from a Marine Corps guy. What if the CDC is actually putting out these drugs to replace the illegal drugs and control the population uh, with zombification? That I mean, rhymed. Like, like, I'm, really, I'm impressed with that rhymed. That, that was, was good. good. That was good. <laughs> yeah, you're talking more along the lines of like a, a mass, almost like mind control, but not really mind control. I am. It, it, I, I see where you're going. I wouldn't go that far. I don't know. It's just... It doesn't seem like it's going to catch on, especially with the bad press it's getting now. Like, oh, do these drugs and you'll eat someone's face off. It's, it, I, don't, I don't know if, I, if I'd go that far, but my personal opinion on it is, 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 is like yours. I'm on both sides. There's the trumpet. <laughs> I'm, yes. I'm on both sides of the fence. You know, one half is I'm saying, oh, no, this guy was just, you know, I've seen the video. He's just fucked up on drugs. But, I mean... And I know you, you love conspiracy theories. You're a bit more into them than I am. Yes, and, and as of recent, <laughs> I've been getting into new websites to deal just with conspiracy theories. And uh, let me tell you, I'm struggling with my sanity. Yeah, well, some of these conspiracy theories are, are way out there. Way, way out there. But some of them are understandable, and I can agree with uh, them being possibilities. But regardless of that, back to uh, what I was saying. I, I do feel that, like, even seeing the video, where's the proof? Like, it's a video of two naked guys, like rolling around you don't actually see him eat the face you have no way to really correlate um these two stories together besides the video and you know how the internet is you say one thing on the internet and it goes crazy like like as far as i know i haven't done research uh within the past week or so but at first everyone was saying oh it's it's a uh, cocaine psychosis with lsd and then they're saying oh it's bath salts and oh it's pcp the thing is toxicology reports take up to two weeks if not more to to be finalized to come through. So there's no way that you, that anyone knew at that point what this guy was on, if anything. But I, I do feel that there's a possibility that it might be a cover-up of some kind, uh, whether it be of the quote-unquote zombie nature or a 28 Days Rage virus or some other, uh, a mutation of mad cow disease. We don't know. I mean, we have no idea. You listen to some of the stories and uh, the eyewitness reports from people who knew this, this uh, the guy who who became the uh, Miami zombie. And a lot of people just, they say that it's completely out of his character to even do drugs like that. Like, yeah, he smoked weed a little bit and he drank, but he was never uh, really heavily into drugs. He was definitely not a violent person. Well, yes, and just to go back to the bath salts again real quick, and this yes. isn't the main topic I want to make, but um, they're, they're easy to get in for the people who smoke marijuana like myself and like, you know the masses of people around the United States, albeit the world. Yeah. Um, it, it's just it's really easy to go to your head shop and see this on the shelf and be like, oh, I'll try that. And the first time, it, you know, you don't have to do it four or five times. The first time you take these things, it's an experience that you know you might not want to remember for the rest of your life. And uh, it, you know, it can take you into into a different world and you can behave ways that you wouldn't normally. You know? Yeah. So. Well, yes, there has not been a toxicology report. It is very likely uh, that these things were involved in some way. Oh, absolutely. I'm not discounting them whatsoever. I'm just saying that everyone was shouting, like, as if it was a definite answer. Like, oh, don't worry, it was just bath salts. When well, so I mean, this is, it's the same as reefer madness. You know, it, everything yeah. was being blamed on marijuana back in, well, I don't know what that was, the 60s, I guess? Uh, yeah, was somewhere between the, the 50s and 70s, so probably the 60s, yeah. Absolutely. But, it, yeah, it's, it's the same as the reefer madness. It's... People just say, oh, it's wheat, oh, it's wheat. Now it's, oh, it's bath salts, you know? So who knows? Maybe we'll find out eventually what, maybe we know now. I just haven't checked out. Uh, I should have probably done my research before we started this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I should have done more research than I did as well. Oh, it's... But the reason we're talking about this, folks, is it wasn't an isolated incident. Over the past two weeks, there's been a rash of cannibalistic uh, crimes going on. Oh, absolutely. There were... Uh... Somebody bit his cousin's nose off. Um, there was a man who stabbed himself in the stomach and threw his intestines at the police officer. Yep, then there was the, the doctor or dentist or someone who spit blood at, at police officers when they pulled him over for a DUI. 
Um, there's there was another one. There's there's been tons. There was even some guy, and this isn't even of a cannibalistic nature, but it's just really really convenient. Um, I found this website at one point that listed all of these events that were all somewhat related in nature to the quote unquote Miami Zombie. Are we talking about the Canadian? Yes, the Canadian. And where was he going? He was going to Miami. Oh, he yeah. was, huh? Yes. I didn't. I didn't hear that. That's See? interesting. Yes, he was. Th- this, in case uh, anyone listening doesn't know this story, uh, let's paraphrase because I don't even know all the details at this point. It's been so long. I don't think anybody does, truthfully. Right. That's true. Yeah. That's true. But um, this gentleman was flying from <clears throat> Canada, as Ernie said, to Miami, Florida, and he was uh, described as being out of it and aggressive. And was trying to break into the cabin. So, or the cockpit, rather, because, yeah. What, whether that's at all related, but it is kind of coincidental that he's on his way to Miami when all this happens. So, folks, just stay away from Miami if you're not already there. And if you are there, watch your back. Shit's getting weird. Strangely enough, I'm not sure that we're talking about the same Canadian. Really? Because well, no, that's not the story that I'm talking about. No, what, the story I'm talking about is the amateur gay porn star. Yeah, no, stick with me here. Stick with me here. All right. This isn't just leisurely activity I'm talking about here. (laughs) Apparently, there's this uh, amateur gay porn star up in Canada who has killed, dismembered, and eaten part of a body and then shipped uh, shipped the rest of the decapitated body, dismembered body, to, I don't know what country, but he shipped it uh, across the seas, and uh, they got him. Oh, that's the story. Exciting. Ah, let's see, that is weird, because now it's making me think <clears throat> that if all of these are somehow related incidences, maybe there's something that's happening in Canada that's being transferred to Miami via flights and airplanes and whatnot. Uh, now, just now, like Outbreak. Exactly, it is just like Outbreak. Now, you mentioned that this, uh, this Canadian gentleman uh, had shipped the body parts to another country. Now, yes, that's correct. What it, now, is there any proof that it was actually him who shipped them, or could it have been somebody covering up for him? It's a valid point. I, I, I don't know too much about the story. Right, I've uh, never heard it, so this is new to me. And this, it's uh, actually, it just developed uh, probably about three days ago is when they caught him. He was suspected for it like a week ago. Right. And then they've actually, I don't know, traced it back to him somehow. So okay. and I think they actually have him in custody at this point. Oh, well, hopefully he's not uh, <clears throat> gnawing down on any other uh, prisoners or you know prison guards. Because that's how it starts. You think you're safe. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> that's true. If you're like us, you never think you're really safe. You're just safer than you could be. So. Well, I mean, we're safer than you. How are you, you being the audience? Oh, I thought, <laughs> I thought you were saying we, as in you and people in New York, are safer than me in Rhode Island. Oh, absolutely not. I live in the worst place for this. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. You're in, you know, super dense population, you know, USA. That's pretty much where you are. But I do have an on-foot plan to get home in three days. Which is, which is good. I've got, you know, my uh, my location where I'm heading. So, I've got my stuff set. But yeah, you know, I think uh, we'll get to that in maybe another episode, survival topics, uh, where we're going, what we're doing, things like that. But let's oh, just... yeah, I forgot this isn't a 24-hour episode. Right, exactly. Yeah, we don't just sit here and talk forever. We have a... Well, a, a, well we can. <laughs> I'm trying to fit it into a strict guideline. All right, so Miami Zombie, we covered that. Well, I mean, there's the uh, the flesh-eating bacteria that's been going going around in the schools on the east coast of the United States recently. That's true. You got that. And there's also, uh, oh, I totally forgot about this stuff. See, I'm, I'm glad I, I picked you. You're reminding me of all the things I wanted to talk about. Yay! <laughs> points. So there's, yeah, there's that fle- the flesh-eating virus or bacteria that's spreading across the east coast. And there's also, again, in Florida, near Miami... All of those high schools that people were breaking out into mysterious rashes mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. the school, and we're all getting shut down. And like the CDC, were coming in in like biohazard suits. And it's just when all of that starts happening within a week of this guy who eats another homeless man's face off, and you've got people shipping dead body parts to other countries after they've eaten them. It's when you get the zombie apocalypse paranoia, man. It's exactly what's going on right now. It is, and and it's. In, in essence, it's really you can't blame anyone because no, absolutely not. It's I'm getting ready. I've been to the shooting range recently. See, I don't even own a gun, which sucks. But I've got my. I, I don't either, but my father does. That's true. That's true. He does. So, you know, I've got my bug out bag ready and my machete is sharpened and my you know survival food supply and water supply are all tucked away. So I mean, I, I've got my stuff set. 
And a little bit later, folks, we'll be talking about makeshift uh, zombie weaponry. That's true. I actually have a link to one of our uh, our movie review that goes into that discussion. So maybe we'll just, uh, you know, we'll, we'll uh, fade those together in a conversation. That's complicated. I don't know if I can do a <laughs> segue like that. We'll see. <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. So next thing I want to talk about is the trailer for the movie Zombie Hamlet. Now, did you see this trailer? I did see the trailer. I, I only saw the trailer yesterday uh, for getting ready for this review. But I gotta say, it, was, it looked delightful. It did. It really did look good. Something about it makes me feel that there might be more to the story in the film than what we're seeing in the previews or the trailer. Yeah, there might be because in the trailer, it just seems like the zombies are actors. Right. But I have this feeling that somehow, some with the with the with the uh, the old lady dying and things like that, that there may be some uh, some real zombification happening. Yeah, I feel the same way. No, yeah. it does take place uh, in the South, correct? If I if I remember from the the scenery, it looks like it's almost in Louisiana. Yeah, if you remember correctly, sure. There's <laughs> well, there's a giant like crocodile walking out of the uh, willow trees. So, but for this <laughs> talent, this talent, it is. <laughs> But for those of you who haven't seen this trailer, um, pretty much the way it looks is you've got this film crew who wants to make Hamlet, and they can't get money for it, and they joke around. Once they get the money, it's nowhere near enough for their budget. But they joke and say, oh, with that budget, we could make a uh, low-budget zombie flick. And and then the director's, oh, yeah, let's do it. So they start, you know, along the same vein of things like uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Mm. Uh, they're, They're making, like, a zombie Hamlet. And it looks pretty good. It looks good. This, the movie looks all right. And folks, a little selling point for all you Kevin Smith fans out there. Jason Mewes appears to be one of the main characters. That's true. That's true. Yeah. What is it? He says, like, uh, to not be or to not not be. Yep. Something along those lines. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah, he, he's doing a pretty good job. Um, at least from a trailer. But I've he, seen. Looks, he looks younger than he did in the he Kevin does. Smith movies. I actually... Um, I listen to Smodcast, which is what the uh, the podcast that Kevin Smith does, and they do a live tour called Jay and Silent Bob Get Old, <laughs> and I, I just listened to one like a week or two ago when they were in uh, Australia, and um, they were just talking about how Jason Mewes has been drug-free, clean for two years. Well, good for him. Let's hear it, folks. Good job. Shout out to you, Jay. Um, Keep it going. But yeah, I think that's why he looks a lot younger and healthier now, just because he's been clean for a while. So that's good. Kudos to him. Yeah, good for him. Totally. <clears throat> and then the next trailer uh, is Zomco. Now, I... now I watched a f- I've watched two or three of these um, because the trailer is really not much to watch by itself. You have to watch the other clips that are included with it on the channel, in my opinion. But I don't know. It seems weak to me. It, it, I mean, I didn't even bother checking out anything past the trailer. I watched yeah. the the really short, kind of like, I, I kind of get what they're going for. But yeah. Well, it's that's the, something that could have been brought to my attention yesterday, so I didn't have to sit through them, because I thought that was the deal. It's good, that, it's good that you did, because now you know more about it than I do. So. Uh, I, I might know more about it than the screenwriter did, to say the truth. <laughs> Spoken by a true filmmaker, or anything. <laughs> I don't know. It just looks... At first, it, it looks like they weren't trying. Right. It, it almost looks like a bunch of kids... Uh, and this is a no offense to the filmmakers, but I, from my experience of being, you know, uh, huge into the uh, certain fan communities and seeing fan film trailers and stuff, it kind of it feels to me like one of those. Mm. Yeah, well, they will take offense to that. Well, maybe that... I don't mean it in a bad way. I mean it how it just feels like... It's, I didn't mean it in a serious way. I thought it would get a laugh. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I can't tell. Sarcasm doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy over Skype, huh? Right. No, no, it isn't. But, um, yeah, pretty much uh, the trailer is just you start seeing these clips of random zombies and all distressed-looking footage and, you know, talking about how the world ended. And then all of a sudden, like, it cuts to this scene where there's, like, a dead guy on a street and this guy in a neon worker vest... Starts like trying to drag away the body to clean up, and I, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Those neon worker vests and that yellow van that they drive around really don't work for me. You know. <laughs> I didn't even see the yellow van. You see, I only watched the trailer, so I didn't even know. It's just a yellow cargo van with like a clearly 
like stickered on Zomco sticker on it. It's horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they still have the yellow outline from the yellow sticker it was printed on, kind of thing. Yeah, this thing looked worse than our first Ecto One. Wasn't that just Dan's car with no logos and like faded brown paint? Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> right, point taken. Point taken. <laughs> All right, moving on. Right. Let's get off of Ghostbusters fan films. Right, let's, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a totally different podcast. <clears throat> All right, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm looking forward to Zombie Hamlet. I'm, I'll probably check out Zomco. <sighs> I'm just on the fence about it. I don't know. I probably won't even check it out. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, can't please everyone. Let's so, try. You can try. <laughs> you can try. So now uh, we're moving to the, fil- the specific film discussion. Uh, area of the podcast. I'm talking about our uh... Night of the Living Dead. Yes, that's exactly. I even have, you know, I have the list, the outline in front of me. I'm reading off of it. And I just couldn't put, get the words out of my mouth. Yeah, the um, the comparison and you know, re- kind of discussion between the original Romero Night of the Living Dead versus the Tom Savini remake in 1990. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Now, I mean, I, I've seen both. I haven't seen the Romero one in a while. So I'm kind of rusty, but I mean, it's, it's a classic. <clears throat> Sorry. Oh. Yes, the original Night of the Living Dead is, is the classic. I mean, I really do enjoy the Romero version. Um, and I recently brushed up on the Savini version for this podcast. And I do have to say that it exceeded my expectations. It, I mean, I've seen it before, but seeing it again, I was impressed with it. It's a good movie. It, it really is. I mean, I, I just love the way Tom Savini kind of rewrote some of the characters, but left a lot of the characters the same uh, to an extent. Yeah, I mean, Barbara was a much stronger character, it's, much more interesting to watch, hotter. Not yes. extremely hot, but much more no. attractive. Yes, yes, and that's, that's important in modern filmmaking. Your lead female has to be attractive. <laughs> Oh, that's. I mean, there's a, there's a lot we can say about this. So where do we start? Um, I guess we can just start with, um, like I, I don't know. I mean, I did like the the Savini one much better, to be honest with you. I mean, I I do, you know, realize that you would without the Romero version, you wouldn't have the Savini version, and that has to give some credit. But I mean, for what it was, a '60s film, black and white, it's really good. Mm-hmm. But I just. You go. You, you were going to say something, I think. Well, there's also... The one thing that really that really gets me about the uh, Romero version is the ending and how, like, racially conscious it is of the time that the movie was made. Yes. And that... I mean, the ending's just fantastic. I mean, to see... Uh, to see... I believe his name's Ben. Uh, yes. To see Ben come out of the house. You know, he had survived the initial onslaught of the zombies. And then he just gets shot. Right, and it it does speak really strongly to the racial tension at the time. And then it's I, I just love the twist that Savini did on the end, where instead of making it alive, he still comes out of that basement and gets shot, but mm-hmm. he's a zombie. Right. <coughs> and then I like how uh, Mr. Cooper is still alive, and Barbara just wastes him at the end. Yes, it's, it's almost like you took both uh, the one portion of the ending from the Romero version, and just kind of split it, but kept parts the same. It, and it just makes Barbara even stronger, a better character. Yes. It's uh, it, it brings her full circle to see her kill him at the end. Yes. Uh, that's that's something I do love about Barbara's character in the Savini version. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Do, I had to do it. I had to do it. Do you know how hard it is to find that audio clip from the Savini version and not the Romero version? It's impossible. I'm trying I'll take to, your word for it. I'm, I'm trying to find it. We're not talking about a dancing toaster, Ernie. Yeah, that's right. I just did that. You I'm, did that. My, my mind was, wasn't even there. Yeah, so. well, my, mine was. So, <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of what I just said. Um, yeah, I've been trying to find clips for the intro to the show. And I've got a couple of good ones, but I, I just can't. I'm looking for that clip. The 1991, because I just I like the way it sounds better than the original version. Are you sure it was 91? Because when I was watching it yesterday, it was listed as 90. It is 90. I, I meant 1990. Okay. Not 1991, like the year, but like 1990 and then the word one. 
Ah, yes. I see. Yes. Lost in translation. Exactly. Lost in translation from English to English. But yeah, I, we got totally sidetracked on the, the discussion of uh, finding the audio clip. But I do love, I love how Barbara's character really, really drastically changes due to her environment and her surroundings and what she's going through. And I feel that in the original one, she just kind of went into shock and stayed there. Yeah, and, and in the new, in the uh, not the new one, the Savini one. Yes. Um, she Barbara's character is the same as the character in Romero's version up until a point, and then she, you know, it's it's pretty much I think the the point where Ben shakes her and he's like, "Stay with me, stay with me," you know, whatever he says to her, and like snaps her out of it. And then from that point on, I feel like she's a very strong character, See, or at I, least she's building to be a very strong character. I think the quintessential point in the film. <clears throat> Um, that sh that you really see her change, and and this is not to be a gender stereotypist or anything like that. But when she puts the pants on, you know, she's wearing the skirt for right, most right. of the movie. Yeah, that's then, a it's a really good symbolism. I didn't pick up on. Way to go! It, it, and it's just I think at that point is when she really you know she puts the pants on, she grabs the shotgun, and she goes to town. Like she's yeah. she's not you know messing around anymore. She's out of shock. She's and then she's the part where she starts shooting Mr. Magruder and like when he walks through the door. No, yeah. no, not Mr. Magruder. Uh, like the the Buddhist zombie. Yeah, she or, shoots him in the head. Yeah, she's like, is he floor. dead in the chest? Is he dead? Boom! And shoots like eight times, and then she yeah. shoots him in the head, and then yeah, she just it's it's such a drastic change, and I love it. I love what Tom Savini did with that section. Yeah, it's, it's almost boner material, ladies and gentlemen. Almost. I wouldn't quite not say quite. it is. Not quite. Almost. Almost. If. <laughs> If she didn't put on the pants, it would be. <laughs> Another thing I liked about uh, the the Elise Savini's version was um, the whole. I just love the the portrayal of the rednecks in the end. I always love the portrayal of rednecks in zombie movies because they never get good portrayal. They're always portrayed as well. Well, they're rednecks. That's, that's this is true, and that's pretty much the only way they get portrayed. But it's just it's funny. Because how in, in this one, and they also did the same thing in uh, Romero's mm -hmm. uh, Dawn of the Dead, where yeah. they, they have that awfully, awfully bad song, like, Cause I'm a Man. Do you remember that song where they're all, like, driving through and there's, like, shooting the zombies that are hanging from the, the trees and stuff like that? I don't know, but I, I in my mind it sounds like a Chevy commercial or something. <laughs> no, it's, Cause I'm a man! <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not quite like that. It's more of, like, a really bad Western country song. And uh, one of the lines I remember is, "I never treat a woman right because I'm a man. Because I'm a man." Hmm. And is this um? Uh, is this what's his name? That was a good question, huh? Is this what's his name? Yeah, the, uh, the, the singer of that song. Oh, I don't freaking know. I don't even know if that movie, that song, ever went anywhere after that movie. Okay, never so, mind. I mean, because there's there's one zombie film that ends with uh, Johnny Cash. Oh, no, no. I think it was the, the recent Dawn of the Dead, was it? Uh, maybe. I know that they used Richard Cheese in that. Oh, uh, yes. That, that I remember. Down with the Sickness. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Yeah, it's definitely not Johnny Cash. It's like this really bad, like, really, really bad song. And But, I mean, I guess some people love the music in the Dawn of the Dead. Uh, I'm just not a big fan, except for that classic, you know, the mall music. <laughs> like the elevator music that ended up yeah. being used as the ending credits for Robot Chicken. Is it really? Yeah, they accept. The, but yeah, watch Robot Chicken again and right. will... make it to the credits, and you'll realize that the song in the end is the music in the mall, but it's being re-sang by chickens. <laughs> but yeah, that's for, that's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Now, you're sounding kind of like a cross between a chicken and a trumpet, but I'm not here to judge your chicken impression. Well, no, it's just me and my roommate were doing that in sync. Oh, oh, I see. So it's just mm -hmm. kind of over overlaid to me. Yeah, he does. He does what I tell him. So gotcha. He's like a trained monkey. I see. But the the one thing we haven't mentioned, which is a a big difference in the two movies, is the makeup. Yes, I was actually thinking about a way to 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 kind of get to that and. I think that the makeup, really, the difference not only comes with time, um, but it's also the fact you had one that was black and white, and your makeup use in a black and white movie, uh, you know, there's that famous uh, mention of, I think it was Alfred Hitchcock using... Chocolate syrup. Exactly. Blood. Yeah. Right, and you could go much simpler to get your point across, because you really only have to worry about shading. There's no discoloration you have to worry about. 
But when, Very true. when you remake a movie like that in 1990, you've got to go all out. And they did, yeah, the makeup in that movie is, is outstanding. And it's, it's brought to your attention immediately. I mean, the, the first zombie that you see in the film is a very, you know, dingy zombie. He's yes. got his skin falling off him. He's bloated. I think he's even missing an eye. Probably is. And, oh, yeah, that's that's a classic, you know. And he walks around back in the movie later with the uh, the grave marker, foam cross, the flower, oh, yeah. kinda, like, stuck in his shoulder as he's, like, shambling his way back to the house. Yeah, that's right. And I remember she sees him, picks him out of the crowd, and shoots him. I oh, remember that. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, as she's walking through the zombies, I believe. It's either when she's walking through, or I think it might be one of the times when she's looking out the back porch. But e- either way, it's at some point in the movie. Now, there is one thing in the Sabini version that I always thought was this way, but I've never actually gone back to check it out. You see an old lady zombie, and they focus on her at, a, at one point. And I always thought that that was Barbara's grandmother, or, or mother, who they were visiting in the cemetery. Hmm. Because you see the picture of her on the tombstone, and then you see this lady walking around, and I think it's the same lady? Could be. Couldn't but tell you, though. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to look that up at some point. And maybe, I don't know, throw some... I'll edit some text of me talking in here. No, I won't. I'm going to leave it the way it is, because it's funnier that way. Speaking of zombie old ladies... Yes. How about the opening scene to Undead? Oh, yeah! Like, yeah, when, I had to stop the thing. I just watched it. Like, I rewatched it again last night at 4 in the morning. So, less than, like, a little over 12 hours ago. Uh, yeah, it's about the time to watch a zombie movie. Of course it is. And yeah. I, I completely had no idea what you were talking about. <laughs> I was like, the opening sequence... It's like, there aren't even zombies. You're in some guy's office in the opening sequence. And then I was like, oh, wait, when the, yeah, the first zombie you see. The meteor comes and hits the old lady. Yes. And it's so badly done in CGI, but it's fantastic. Oh, yeah. And you gotta think, though, that movie was, I think, uh, 2000? Yeah, that movie was up in 2000, or 2002. It was, it was, yes, because she was, uh, Miss Catch of the Day. When yeah. It was, she was Miss Catch of the Day 2002. Okay. And it was 10 years ago, so that's... But, I mean, for 2002 and for a non-big-budget company, the, the effects, the, the CGI really aren't that bad. No, there, I mean, there was, there was you could notice that it was CGI, but it was such creative CGI that you just don't care. Right, it doesn't really, like, change or affect the, uh, the outcome of the film or anything like that, or really detract from it. Right? No, not at all. Uh, yeah, I, I love that whole, um, that whole kind of throwback to... Even again, this is mentioned in the Romero Night of the Living Dead, and I think possibly even the Savini version, that the zombie virus or the zombie bacteria came from a meteor or a meteor, yeah. and that's essentially that's exactly what happened in Undead. And I just I love that throwback to that kind of older thought that oh zombies come from space or next it's going to be you know radiation because that was a big thing at the time you know with nuclear power and nuclear bombs and things like that. Although in the undead, it wasn't just a chance happen, uh, happening with a meteorite. It was actually aliens uh, making this happen. See, here's the thing. I disagree because that's not really the that's not really completely fleshed out in the movie. And I think it's kind of up to interpretation. Okay. Now I don't think. I think they're two separate instances. Yes, I think that the aliens come because they know the meteorites are coming. And they're, they come to protect us from the meteorite crashes. I don't think that they sent them, because if they sent them, why would they come and help and heal everybody? I don't know. See, it's complicated, because, like you said, it's open to interpretation, because after the aliens leave, shit hits the fan. Well, here's the thing. The, the shit hits the fan, but not because the meteorites. I think the aliens were only tracking the, uh, the meteorites that were traveling around the galaxy and the universe and following them. But since the meteorites were left, and by their accounts, everybody had been saved. They had already cured everyone. So they were like, okay, everyone's cured, we can leave. But when the zombies came back, it wasn't because of the meteorites, it was because of that stupid freaking idiot in his airplane who wasn't clean. Because, you know, he was the one who started everything again. Yeah, I guess you're right. He was the only one who was in the uh, contamination zone that made it out without being quote-unquote cured, as uh, the alien said. Hmm. So, I don't know. I Like I said, it could be that they caused it, but I can't think of any reason that they would... I mean, again, they're aliens. They don't exactly have the same mindset as I do, but... Uh, they did have a sense of humor, though. Oh, yeah, I was I was just thinking about that. Yeah, the end scene where he takes off his clothes to show that he's an alien. You know, it's like... It's like, I'm not ashamed of my body. Yeah, put your clothes back on. I'm not ashamed of who I am, or whatever. 
I'm comfortable with who I am, something like that. It's so good. Yeah, it was a nice little uh, comic relief there at the end. Mm-hmm. Now, back to the uh, the earlier scenes in the movie, since we've already jumped from the beginning to the end without really getting into the middle. But we haven't spoiled anything, we, actually. Oh, oh, what do you mean we haven't spoiled anything? We, when, you, when you look at the trailers, you have no idea there's going to be aliens involved. Well, what, maybe what, maybe there's not. Thing? You, I don't know. Yeah, maybe we'll know about this whole thing. <laughs> this is all disinformation. We work for the government. Well, I don't. I was trying to think of something clever to say to sound kind of... No, I, was, I, was, I think the silence worked. I think it did. I think it did. Yeah. All right, well, the, the one thing I'd say, the movie as a whole, the downfall of the entire movie, in my opinion, was the score. Absolutely. I I have a little notepad with things I want to talk about, and that is next on my list. Yep, I got it in my little mole skin right here. Yep, we did the same thing. It sounded like Disney's The Fox and the Hound. It sounded like Disney's The Fox and the Hound, written on, like, a 1994 computer using a MIDI programmer. It was very strange. It was... <laughs> and the thing is, is, I feel that if you had a different score or a different soundtrack or just different music, the whole movie would be totally different feel. Absolutely. I mean, the the trailer has a decent score soundtrack to it, you know? Mm-hmm. It gives you the feeling of, like, impending doom and, you know, I want to watch this movie, I want to get scared. You're watching the movie and there's scary things happening, but it's like symphonies and shit going around. I feel that trumpets are not well to be used in suspenseful situations, and it's pretty much their entire score was digital trumpets. Man, you got to bring back the theremin, you know? You do. You need the theremin? And then you need a lot of strings, because strings, uh, for me anyways, they it's like instill anxiety and discomfort when used in the right way, which trumpets really don't do. If you use them the wrong way, you get knots all over the place and you get tied up. <laughs> that, that's true. Um, yeah, so yeah, the soundtrack wasn't a big thing. It reminded me, have you ever seen a Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog? Uh, that's the William Patrick Harris thing, right? Me, yes, Neil Patrick. Neil Patrick, sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> William Patrick, yeah. That's, yeah, that, it's that thing. The opening sequence music for that reminds me of the music from Undead, if you remember it at all. I don't, it's, but I believe you. Yeah, if you rewatch it or you see it at any point, it'll probably remind you of the music from Undead. Because the whole time, I was like, yeah, it's very similar. One of the first things I noticed in... Um, this, Undead. In, well, of course in Undead, but in the scene in the house where you first meet the police officers... Yes. One of the things that drove me nuts is they did like that classic Hollywood cliche of the magic revolver, where you've got a six-shot revolver that somehow, without reloading, shoots 19, 21 bullets with, with, without stopping. Well, he's just, you know, sleight of hand. Oh, of course, yeah. That bumbling idiot has great sleight of hand. <laughs> oh, I loved his character. Oh, yeah. Was, all the, the way he cursed, where he just would, would talk shit and say fuck between every <laughs> other word. <laughs> that wasn't a good impression. But no, yeah. it wasn't, but it, it got the point. It's just so good how he just always kept swearing all the time. But he was you could tell he was just terrified. But then you get to that point where he, you know, to quote Zombieland, uh, nut up or shut up. He just kind of just says, "I'm gonna get, a, I'm gonna get us out of this," and then tries to climb the wall and falls off and dies. <clears throat> Climbing the wall was pretty ballsy, gotta say. It was well, yeah. When you see a wall where you can't see the top of it and it goes on forever and it's covered in giant metal spikes, and you decide, "I'm gonna climb this to see if we can get over it." Extremely ballsy. Extremely ballsy, especially from a character like that. But I, I do feel it was kind of out of nowhere from a filmmaking perspective. There was no um, really benefit. There was no character development up to that point. It was just like he was a bad you know, cop. He was a chihuahua running with his tail between his legs, trying to act all being bad at the same time. And he then was almost, very, he was very much a chihuahua. You're right. Yeah, that's how I picture him. He's always like that high pitched, like yelping when he's when he's swearing, and he kind of whimpers when he's like sad or scared. Oh, he doesn't really get sad, he just gets scared because he's a chicken shit. And then, like, blink of an eye goes from that to trying to be the hero. I don't know, that just kind of set me up. It's kind of jarring. Yeah, it is. It's almost like when you were uh, talking to me about the the short film I made with Dan back in the day, and how you said that one camera angle change, because I didn't know that... Oh, yeah, the 180 degree rule. The 180 rule, I didn't know that. And you were like, it's it's not bad, it's just kind of jarring. I felt that his quote-unquote character development was jarring in that same sense. Oh, uh, yeah, I feel you. Well, I gotta say, there's some really interesting and unique deaths. Oh, sorry, that was my zombie apocalypse thing again. 
say I think there's some very interesting, unique deaths. Uh, some of them were a little, they're a far stretch of the imagination. Like, you're not going to cut a zombie in half with an auto club. No, and I mean, that's actually one of the things I was going to get at, and I'll get back to that in a few minutes. But immediately after seeing the auto club that can't cut through somebody, cut through somebody, you do get to see something that is very capable of cutting through somebody. Oh, yes, the uh, the triple shotgun. Mm-hmm. Classic. It, it's it's kind of reminiscent to a uh, pump-action version of the four-barreled shotgun from Phantasm, if you've ever seen it. I don't I know have. that. Yeah, the four-barrel shotgun that goes to a point in, like, Phantasm 2. That's a badass shotgun. But it's kind of like that. It's, it's not pointed, and they're, you know, pump action. But it's it's a really great idea. I, I love the design of that weapon. And the kills that come from it, or... Oh, yeah, freaking cuts that guy right in half, at the, right at the waist. And the spine's still wiggling. Oh, it's yep. great. Wonderful. It's, 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 it, that is definitely a great scene. Um, speaking of that character, Marion, where the hell... Does this guy keep the guns on him half the time? I don't know. At one point, he, like, kicks his ass and two, uh, two handguns come flying up out of his back pockets. Yeah, it's like all this crazy, like, this, I, I love it. I love that part about the character. But they're always hidden in his clothes. They're never on holsters, you know? Like, there's that great scene where he, uh, like, shoots, he shoots the guns up out of his jacket and he, like, kicks his, his spurs into the wall above the oh. Yeah, that was a good one. Swing. That's like a classic scene right there. I love that scene. Uh, that but, one's in the trailer. Basically. Yeah, but they do they do reference his like where the hell are your guns coming from in uh, the scene after the big acid rain. Yeah, which is always something you want to do if you have something that's overly realistic. You want to call it out. Yeah. Just so it makes it a little bit more realistic. Yeah. So you know they 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 change all their clothes because of the acid rain and they're in the general store. They're, he's he's buck fucking naked. No pockets. No nothing. They don't even have guns with them anymore. He gets redressed and then pulls two more guns out of nowhere. <laughs> and then that douchebag boyfriend is like, where the hell did you pull those from? Because it's, it's just funny. That's the whole damn movie. He just keeps pulling guns out of nowhere. Well, he's a prepper, man. That's what they do. It, it is. I'm going to have guns taped to the inside of my thigh into my armpits, shoved other unmentionable places. I'll get a derringer for that. <laughs> so what, el what else can we say about this magnificent movie? Um, It's good. A uh, few things. I, I feel like the camera work was very reminiscent of uh, Evil Dead movies. Yes. One of the shots that really made me feel that way, specifically, was that weird Dutch angle that they pulled when mm -hmm. um, they were coming out of the basement. And there was several, like, uh, long-lasting single shots as well. Yeah, which is very... Uh, With the, the camera whip going on. And the, the camera operator pulled it off, got to say. Uh, yeah, absolutely excellent camera work in that film. Uh, I think there's one last thing about Undead that we got to mention. All right, what is it? And we'll just leave it out there. Zombie fish, people. That's right, zombie fish, which makes very little sense to me, how <laughs> zombie fish can fly. But it's an excellent but scene. It really, it really is. It's just so ridiculous. Where he's in this boat, and then the meteor crashes into the fish he already caught. And then the fish starts Good aim. Watching. Good aim, meteor. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm gonna... They always... That's something else. The meteors always find life forms to hit. And then a meteor the size of a freaking baseball hits a f one fish in a boat. All of us. They couldn't have just hit the lake and turned all of them into zombie fish. No, 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 no. They hit the one fish. But then the other fish around them turn anyways. But I just... I love how they fly. Flying zombie fish need to be in every zombie movie. And flying zombie fish need to get punched in the face. <laughs> yes, they do. They do. Absolutely. So back to what you said earlier um, about the auto club. Ah, yes. Now that is absolutely ridiculous to me. But I did think, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it can't cleave anything in half. No, I know where you're going with this, and I agree with you 100%. Are you talking about how it actually does make a good weapon? Yeah, you can use it as a bludgeoning tool, and within a few whacks, I'm sure you could incapacitate the brain. Oh, absolutely, because, I mean, it's designed to withstand being broken. Mm-hmm. And it extends, so you can collapse it, if you still have the key, to a smaller, more uh, carryable size. It's almost like a, a really ghetto police baton. Very ghetto. You know, where you can just, like, sling it out, and it just gets nice and big, and... <laughs> Zombie apocalypse, people won't be stealing cars, they'll be stealing clubs. Yeah, they'll be cutting the wheel off just to get the damn club up. And then leave the car, who gives a crap, we don't have gas anyways. So, speaking of the auto club as a weapon, that brings us to our next section. Uh, makeshift weaponry and its use in the post-apocalyptic world. It's a very important topic, Jeff, because, uh, you know, 
come zombie apocalypse, not everybody's going to have the money to buy all these things to prepare ahead of time. And once shit hits the fan, they're not going to be able to find these things anywhere. So you got to, you know, you got to cope with what you got. Right. You really have to learn to improvise. But a lot of the issues I see with uh, the average show improvising weapons is I I feel a lot of people are not going to take into consideration the longevity and abuse that your weapon can take. Mm -hmm. And a perfect example was the Auto Club. Um, Now, I I do love the Auto Club for its expandable uh, nature, and it is relatively rigid. I think I heard Rachel laughing in the background. You you might have. You might have heard the cat. Once I shut the doors to my room, the cats will, like, pull outside and meow because they hate doors being closed. Sorry, I had to call it out because you keep pulling out the trumpet. Oh, no, it's it's fine. (laughs) Call it out whatever you want. It's fine with me. Um, but yeah, th- like the auto club, it would be really good because it is rigid, like I said. But I, f- I feel that the locking and latching mechanism would give way, maybe after like twenty good hits, whether they be in rapid succession or over a matter of minutes, hours, days. I do feel that eventually it would give out. So it, it does have pros and cons to it. I don't know. I, I, one of the things I always end up doing is when I go somewhere new. One of the first things I do is I, is I go into the place I'm going, like, let's say it's my first day on a job. I look around. I look, I'm like, all right, if there if zombies show up while I'm at this work and I'm in this location, what can I grab to get the hell out of here? And one of the things I always keep on myself now is I got one of those uh, bracelets of the 550 cord. Oh, the parachute cord bracelets. Yes, because there's a store right near my house that sells them for like three bucks. So I plan on getting a bunch of them and giving them out to friends at some point. Yeah, they're pretty nifty. They really are, and I, I have it on me at all times. And I started carrying around uh, my really small multi-tool called a Gerber Artifact, and it's got a bottle opener because every multi-tool has to have a bottle opener. Of course. Um, it's got a bottle opener, a mini pry bar, Phillips head flathead, and an X-Acto knife on it. And I was like, well, okay. An X-Acto knife? Yeah. Like a really fine blade? Yes, a full nice. lockable X-Acto knife. On, and it's, it's tiny, it's tiny. It's one flat piece of metal. It's not Impressive. Like normal, it is. It's not like a normal multi-tool where it like folds open and there's like pliers and such. This is just a flat, it looks like a little tiny black crowbar. Okay. With stuff on it. And it's really, really great. Rachel got it for me for Christmas, and I love it. And I was like, you know, pretty much with those two tools, I can make a weapon anywhere. Enough to, to like fight off one or two zombies to get myself to a car or out of the, you know, out of the thick of it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I always just look for anything that's like a bludgeoning tool, like a pipe or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. And if, uh, if you're working in the film industry, C-stand arms are great bludgeoning tools. I know this from experience. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've had to take out some uh, unruly co-workers with a C-stand arm. Well, yeah, you know, occasionally. It, it happens, you know. People just get disgruntled at their work for ridiculous reasons. Well, I mean, people are taking bath salts. That's true. And it comes full circle. Like like everything with us does. Uh-huh. So, okay. As far as uh, weapons are concerned, now, if you get your immediate tool um, and you, you know, get to your car, get to where you're going, you get home maybe to your garage or something, what do you think you can do with the stuff in your garage? Or your, any, not necessarily garage, but your little workshop space if you have one. Well, well you know... I think that really goes to what you have. I mean, if you're going bare bones, what everyone has, you're going to grab a hammer. You're going to see if you have a crowbar. But even even the further away from the norm, one of the things I've, I always found would be useful is a push broom. Yeah. And, and you're like, what? Hold on, a push broom? But you got to think about it. You've got a really long handle, so it's got great reach. And it's, it's essentially a... Moving, you can move a zombie. It's a pushing tool where if you got two of them in front of you, one of them in front of you, aim it for their chest and just shove. And you've already got that one twice as far away from you than it was before. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to, you know, uh, incapacitate his brain, but you can push him off a cliff. Push him off a cliff or just push him away so you can get out of the, mm-hmm. out of where you are, you know. Because sometimes it's not even, <clears throat> it's not even really about uh, incapacitating the zombie as it is getting away from it. That's very true. I mean, as long as we don't have the, uh, the the fast running and the intelligent zombies, I think we'll be all right with that option. And, and Just pushing them away. Right, right. 
at least until you can get your hands on a weapon or something that can help you out. Right now, recently I was watching something, and it, for all I know, it could have been Undead last night, or it was a video game trailer or something of that sort. Uh, I came across a really cool little makeshift weapon. If you have tools in your garage, if you're a handyman, and you have a, a yard that you tend to, if you have a weed whacker and you have a circular saw, you slap that circular saw on that weed whacker, you've got a nice extendable, like, six-foot reach on a spinning blade. That's, it was definitely not an undead, but that is a great idea that I never thought of. Yeah, I saw, I don't know where I saw it, but I saw it recently, and it was, I was like, oh, genius. That is, that's, that's a really, really good idea, because I think the reason you're thinking of undead is because uh, the main character, who, just a little uh, back, back to what we were saying before, and I'll jump right back into now, I do feel that she kind of had a same uh, transition in character like Barbara did in the Savini version of Night of the Living Dead. Because she started off as kind of this this weak... I mean, the only thing she had was a freaking auto club and she was scared to death. Mm-hmm. And then at one point, she just gets the, the broom handle stuck on a rotary saw blade and just starts freaking, like, going to town. Yeah. And I think that that was her transformation point. But I think that, that scene is why you were thinking of the uh, circular saw blade on the Whitwacker. Yeah, probably. And that's and cool. just also, I've seen it in the last week, and the reason I've been watching zombie stuff in the last week is for this. So I figured maybe it was something I watched. It's, it's very People possible. Do it. It's absolutely possible. But anyway, great idea. Absolutely great idea. It re- I, yeah, I would have never thought about that. And it's easy to do? It, yeah, of course it is. I mean, all you got to do is just get down to the... The mounting points of the yeah. piece of hardware and just put a nut and a bolt through it and it should be fine. Yeah. For the most part. Washer. You're probably going to need a washer. Yeah, like a lock washer. You might as well just d- freaking cover it in super glue and epoxy just to be safe. Yeah. <laughs> well, but then about what What about if it, uh, you know, the blade gets dull, you got to change it. Well, then you know what you do? You just break the blade and then epoxy a new one onto the old blade. It's doable. It's, it's, doable. it's, it's doable. Whatever. It's zombie apocalypse. You make right. it happen. Exactly. You got you to gotta be very MacGyverish. When things like this go down. MacGruber! I've never seen MacGruber. Eh, don't worry about it. Yeah, I heard it was good, but yeah. Uh, regardless of MacGruber and his uh, use in today's world. So, kind of in the same vein of garden tools and things you have at home, uh, a while back, I actually stumbled upon this pre-made, perfect zombie apocalypse survival weapon. And I've never heard anybody mention it. Mm. And it's, it's, it's this thing called a bush axe. Oh, okay. And now a bush axe, it sounds like maybe like it's like a machete, you know, for chopping up a bush. No, 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 no. A bush axe is, <clears throat> all right, you know how you have the drywall tool where it's got like, it's like the kind of crescent blade, but it's on a little handle? Yeah. Imagine a, the same kind of blade, but it's a little fatter and wider with a heavier metal, and it's a foot and a half tall. The blade is a foot and a half, and it's mounted onto a six-foot axe handle. Yeah, it's intimidating. Yeah, and I mean, it's perfect. It's got the point on the tip for penetrating the skull. It's got the blade for decapitating and cleaving a head clean off, and it's got the six-foot reach, so you don't ever have to even worry about getting too close, as the issue is with, like, using, say, a ball peen or a claw hammer or even a machete. The the bush axe, it's got all the good things. It's got weight. It's got a sharp blade. It's got a burrowing point, and it's got that at least six-foot reach, and it's a great, great weapon, and the funniest thing is I actually thought about making one before I even knew they existed. I had come up with this idea in my head to mount that blade and weld some half metal rings and use leather strapping to get it onto a blade or to a handle. Come to find out the thing already exists. And it's the same price. It's like fifteen, twenty dollars at Home Depot. Not bad. No, Not bad. And you you get that, you grind the blade really, really sharp and nice, and you just there you go. Bush axe. Perfect weapon. Absolutely perfect weapon. Yeah, slice them and dice them. Right. Uh, I recently saw uh a clip on YouTube on how to make your own shotgun, which I do not recommend to anybody. <laughs> oh, I would never, unless you are a licensed, not even licensed, unless you know what the hell you are doing with any kind of gunsmithing, don't ever make your own gun. These guys were literally making them out of steel pipe. You know, I think I saw, like, I was looking up something, and I saw either a link to that or an instructable about the same damn thing, and I was like, I'm not even going to watch this. Because yeah, the link. The link's how I found it. I looked up something else, and then it was like it was next to it. And I was like, "What? Make? I gotta look at this." Yeah, it's ridiculous. I didn't even want to <laughs> give them another freaking view because I knew it was gonna be a bad idea. Don't be making your own shotguns, folks. Don't. Just steal them from other people. Exactly. That's the thing. 
I, there's going to be lots of dead people laying around with, you know, clutching shotguns. Just yeah. pick them up. Pick it up. You're, all, you're good to go. You may not have one at first, but you'll get one eventually. Don't worry about it. You don't need one right now. I think that, that pretty much covers makeshift weaponry. I mean, unless you have something else. Oh, shields. So that's the thing you got to talk about. No, I did. I, this is another thing I saw about makeshift weaponry uh, recently. Now, Jeff, you, you're probably familiar. I have these, uh, I have a set of uh, swords that are actually forearm mountable. And I, yes. I consider them my blood rain swords. Yes, yes. Okay. Now, for those of you who don't, don't know what I'm talking about, the sword blade uh, goes from your elbow to about like about a foot and a half above, above your fingertips. And it's got a little grip that you can hold on to. Now, I've seen somebody uh, who hacked this thing and made it into a pistol as well. So when he's holding the sword, he's also holding two pistols. Oh, that is badass right there. Yeah. I don't think, you know, uh, reloading would be that easy. But, uh, you know, you'd at least have a good 12 shots or something. Um, well, 12 shots per pistol. or Well, depending on what, I think uh, I think it's 13 for, like, an M9, like a Beretta. I think it's 13 shots. So that's 23 total, plus a foot and a half long blade patched your fingertips. And your forearms, which you could use to, like, slice them with your forearms. That's a little too close for comfort for me. But... Hey, sometimes you got to sacrifice comfort. You really do, absolutely. So, it, one. I, one final thing I'd like to throw into uh, the weaponry topic is that, you know, a lot of us, you know, we can't get guns uh, in the states that we're living in. For example, I can't get one here in New York without some major legal issues going down. Right. Um, but in my bug out bag, and the, we'll discuss bug out bags in another episode. Yeah. Uh, but in my bug out bag, I actually carry an elastic exercise band. Now, you're probably asking yourself why. You're going to do Pilates out there in Zombie Apocalypse? I, I think well, I no. know why, so continue. Let's see if I'm right. Yeah, you can make yourself a good little slingshot out of a tree or something. Yep. You know, just string it up between two trees and get a, I don't know, coconut. If you live in a state that has coconuts. <laughs> get a, get an old zombie body part. Use that. Yeah. You no? Know? Just let it fly. I mean, these things have a really great... Um, what I want to say, like, test to them. Like, you're not going to tear them that easily. No, of course not, no. And they're lightweight, you can carry it around with you everywhere. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, one of my friends, Holly, you know Holly, uh, she actually is training, and has been training with with the use of a slingshot for four years, ever since I lived in Connecticut when I bought it for her, or I took her to buy it, rather, because you can buy them there. Um, and yeah, like, you can't own one in Massachusetts. I don't think you can own one in Rhode Island, but in Connecticut, you can and, and she's had a wrist rocket forever, and she's you know she practices with it. I think she has like a bag of glass marbles that she uses as practice shots, and I'm sure she'll grab some heavy ball bearings to use those instead when it, you know shit hits the fan. But yeah, yeah marbles are a good substitute though. They they really are. I mean, I think they're harder they're hard enough to break through skull, but th- break through bone at a high enough speed. So especially if you get them right in the eye socket. Ooh. Oh. I oh, the, oh, that the delicious. Uh, yeah, the thought of it happening to you when you're not undead is <laughs> is terrifying. That's bad news. But speaking of uh, places to get things and how you can't get things in some places, um, I'm going to bring us to our next topic, Map of the Dead. Matt, did you check out Map of the Dead? Could you find it? Now, I had seen a map that is pretty much listing all the, the cases of the zombification that has gone on recently, and most of it's on the East Coast, if that's the map you're talking about. That is actually not the map I'm talking about. Okay. So I've, I did not find that map. I wish I found that map, because if I found that map and this map... And I linked these two maps together, I would have the ultimate zombie survival map. You'd have an Uber map? I, I would. I would have Das Uber map. No, the map I'm talking about is at mapofthedead.com. And what it is, is it takes your standard Google Maps style map. And first of all, it gives it a great color scheme. Light gray and dark gray. And, re- and red. Ooh. And now, uh, this, uh, this map specifically, it has two really awesome features to it. Now, one of the features is it shows you from icons locations. Now, I think I still have it up. I don't have it up, so I'm not going to look at it. But it's got it, it shows you hospitals, gun stores, um, outdoor supply, food place, uh, you know, supermarkets, uh, pharmacies, churches, cemeteries, army depots, everything that you would ever need to know where it is to get there or to stay away from there are mm-hmm. all listed on this one map. Oh wow! Now, the, my only issue, I, I have a. Uh, a couple of issues with that setup. One, it doesn't list all of them. And while it's not that bad if it's places to get to, like you try to find a gun store and it doesn't list every gun store, but it still shows you where three of them are. That's that's good. That's better than no gun stores. 
But, you know, if we're going to reference uh, the Zombie Survival Guide by Max Brooks, you want to stay away from churches, hospitals, and police stations. And those are, if, if those are not all listed on the map. And I found out because there was a hospital that I could find on the map, but it wasn't icon shown as a hospital. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's, that's kind of iffy. And another thing is they, they color code. They color code everything so it's easier to find. But I, I find a flaw in their color coding. If you get a chance to check this website out, I think it should be colored. Not it doesn't really make sense because they'll group things together that should be together with other items in their color coding. But the color coding should also be showing you good places, like the the safety of the places you're looking for. Not like like green is a good place, red is a bad place, and anything in between those two will be varying degrees of how much you want to be there or how much you don't want to be there. That and, makes sense to me. And, yeah, but they don't list it like that. And it kind of... I, I was kind of unsettled about that, and I thought it should have been done in a better way. But one thing they do really well is they list... Uh, you can click... You know how on Google Maps you've got, like, satellite uh, map? Street view. Exactly. This one has a little button that says no danger zones and then danger zones. You click on danger zones, and no, it does not start playing the theme to Top Gun. <laughs> It um, will actually highlight in red all of the highly populated areas on the map. So if you if you if you're in the middle of nowhere and you need to know where the next town is that's going to be a threat and where they maybe where the undead might be coming from to go in opposite direction, all you got to do is click that danger zone and it will show you where all the high population is on the entire country. Now, is it, do you know if this is a an app that you can download or is it just I know a website? There's a game. I don't know if the game is also a useful app or if it's some other kind of thing, but if you go to mapofthedead.com, there's two links you can click. On the left is the map, and on the right is something for an iPhone, or I don't know if it's Android, but I know it's at least iPhone. All right, cool. I got an iPhone. There you go. But yeah, I mean, check it out. You know, there there is an app. I don't know what the app does because I don't have an iPhone. I didn't look into it, but it very well could be just the map. It could be the map of a game. It could be just a game. I don't even know how it would be a game, unless it's like that zombie running game where... Ah, uh, parkour? I, I don't even know. I uh, just know it's some, I, it's some iPhone game that helps you run. Like I, I have zombie parkour or something like that. It's great. Do you? It has like the goals and things like that and audio that plays for you to get from point A to point B. Is it something like that? Well, no, you just run away from zombies. Oh. But this, this, the one I'm talking about has like... Uh, you have to require... Uh, like go to certain locations on your map to get like a briefcase or like a supply of food and bring it back and all this stuff. So it's actually really cool. Nah, that's not the one I'm talking about. No. Well, I'm sure there's a bunch now. <clears throat> oh, yeah, the one I play is for like five year olds. Oh, okay. This one's, yeah, this was an actual running app. It's not like a video game. Like you have to run outside, and run around your town. Oh, I yeah, gotcha. Yeah. It's, it's, I gotcha. It's like, it's a like reality. reality. Yes. It's a AR. It's an alternate reality game. But yeah, so I guess, yeah, that's, I check out mapofthedead.com for those of you who haven't checked it out. I think they recently upgraded it because I went to something very, very similar that didn't have the danger zones. So if you went before, check it out again because now they have danger zones and it's a really great option to have. But uh, with that being said, and danger zone, the song, we're Can not going to play that now. No, I'm not going to play that. You're not going to play it. No one's going to play that song. But it is going to take us into our next section, non-zombie songs that make you think about zombies. And I really, I did this with one song in particular in mind. And I know that we discussed earlier before the recording that you said there was really only one song you could think of. Well, yeah, and it's it's not something that has always like generally come to my mind as a zombie sounding song, but just given the, uh, the task of coming up with a zombie, uh, a song that makes me think of zombies, it's not actually about zombies. Immediately, I had to go to the Smashing Pumpkins, and I would say there's probably two songs that make me think of zombies by the Smashing Pumpkins, and that would be Bullet with Butterfly Wings and The End is the Beginning is the End. Gotcha. And it, now, now, why exactly those songs in particular make you think of zombies? Well, I mean, the lyrics, uh, I mean, and The End is the Beginning and the End, for itself, it's a very apocalyptic feeling uh, to this. So both, both of the songs have a very apocalyptic feeling to them. Um, the end is the beginning is the end kind of deals with things that that sound like reanimation in the lyrics like the sewers belch me up the heavens spit me out from either tragic i am born again uh zombie pretty much good yeah enough. that's yeah. good enough for you um now the song that i thought of is a song by this band called straight light run 
Um, and the song is called Hands in the Sky, in parentheses, Big Shot. Kind of like how it was Woomp, in parentheses, there it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very similar to the title of the song. There's a lot of, it's, 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 I don't know if it's actually about zombies, or, but it does feel very apocalyptic. And um, there's like a line in the song, women and kids of all ages, millions of men with blank faces. Uh, and then th- one of the best parts is, uh, and we'll tell you when they're hungry again. It never ends, never ends, never ends. Then the chorus, not even because there's no real chorus to this song. It's just kind of going. Uh, the part that the title of the song comes from says, Big Shot Screaming, Put Your Hands in the Sky. He says, Give it up, boy. Give it up or you're going to die. You'll get a bullet in the back of the neck, in the back of the neck right between the eyes. Which, it's clearly a great place to be shooting a zombie because not only are you going to destroy the brain, you're also going to sever the uh, spinal column. Mm-hmm. And it just talks about, like, uh, newspaper headlines about things like that. And I can't tell if it's really maybe about somebody robbing a bank. Which is what it could be from. I wonder when they'll come get me. I wonder when they'll come get me. Maybe they're talking about the police who are breaking in. Or maybe it's about a guy who's hiding behind a desk. Who knows? It could be about war. I don't know. Makes me think about zombies. Check out the song. Check out uh, the two Smashing Pumpkin songs that Ernie has listed. Both with butterfly wings. And the end is the beginning is the end. Yeah. Which was the... It was a song on the Batman and Robin soundtrack. No, don't. Then don't check it out because nothing... Yeah, will... I, 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 I'm not recommending it. I'm <laughs> just telling you. It reminds me of zombies. Right. You can always check out, you know, the Cranberries zombie. Yeah, but see, that's the thing is I wanted to have non-zombie songs. Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, now you're fucking it up. Now you're fucking it up. I'm, not, I'm just thinking inside the box. No, this show... Damn it, this show thinks <laughs> inside the box. This show thinks outside the box. Well... You think outside, I think inside. It's a good dynamic. That is. Then we have the entire realm of the box covered. Inside. Dude, we got the perimeter. We got the circum, the area. I don't know. We got like geological terms, <laughs> or geometrical terms. <laughs> yeah, even better. Even better. Oh, I'm so leaving this in so people can hear you flubbing up things about terminology. Well, that's the point. That is the point. That's it. For- <laughs>